1798, the zoologists of the British Museum in London met to examine the skin of an extraordinary animal which had been sent to them from New South Wales by a colonist called Dawson. That animal was completely different from anything they had ever seen before. Its fur was like that of an otter, it had webbed feet like a duck, a flat tail like a beaver, and in place of a mouth, a duck's bill. Those experts declared Dawson's animal to be an elaborate hoax, but in reality, it was just one example of an entirely different wildlife. Millions of years of isolation had made it possible for a process of parallel evolution to take place in Australia. Ancient groups of mammals who had tried their luck in the fight for survival had almost entirely disappeared from the other continents. While alone on this enormous island in the southern hemisphere, they were able to diversify far away from their better equipped competitors. Australia separated from the rest of the world and became a gigantic Noah's Ark where those original inhabitants of Gondwana, the supercontinent which contained all the lands of the southern hemisphere, were able to prosper. Here life evolved along different lines, and the continent of Australia became home to unique zoological species. The fish experimented with lungs, the birds grew to almost two meters, the trees became fire resistant, and the mammals laid eggs. The story of the inhabitants of this Terra Australis can be traced back to the distant days when all the continents of the Southern Hemisphere were one. Dense rainforests covered the edges of the supercontinent Gondwana. The world was then a warmer and more humid place in which enormous dinosaurs ruled over a zoology in permanent evolution. But alongside the enormous prehistoric dragons, Protected within the jungles, lived other smaller and more recent creatures, waiting for the climatic changes which would prove to be an insuperable obstacle for the powerful lizards. The remains of that universal jungle can still be seen in the northeast of Australia and are now home to the descendants of the long extinct dinosaurs. The birds are the most numerous species in this green, suffocatingly humid world. Their ability to fly meant that they were not condemned to isolation like the land creatures of Australia, and competition with the species from the rest of the world produced new types of bird, which then came to these Jurassic forests and stayed forever. Here there were no large predators and food was plentiful, so many species of birds became part of the history of this independent evolution giving rise to extraordinary creatures. The cassowary is one of the heirs to the gigantic birds which inhabited the jungles of Gondwana. Those common ancestors evolved into the ostriches in Africa, the rares in South America, and the emus and cassowaries in Oceania. The common cassowary measures almost 2 meters and weighs around 60 kilos. A giant in terms of present-day birds, but a mere lightweight when compared to its close relative, the moas. Both moas and cassowaries were descended from a common ancestor, and the moas inhabited New Zealand until the arrival of the Maoris in 1350. They measured almost 4 meters and weighed 250 kilos. 
But even they had a bigger brother, the elephant bird, weighing 500 kilos. Yet another of the children of Gondwana, when the supercontinent split apart, it survived only in Madagascar and eventually died out. Despite its appearance, the cassowary is a relatively recent bird. It is believed that it only separated from its primitive ancestor around 10,000 years ago. On the other hand, other more normal-looking birds are among the oldest inhabitants of these Australian jungles, the mound builders, a group of birds which were the first to become separated from the main branch of ornithological evolution. The Australian brush turkey is the most representative example of the Australian mound builders. The males build nests, which can be up to a meter high, by collecting together up to four tons of vegetable material. Tiny fungi live among the dead leaves, decomposing them and releasing heat as they breathe. In this way, the nest becomes a gigantic incubator. In it, a number of females lay their eggs and the male will look after them, making sure that the temperature of the nest remains constant. It is believed that somewhere on their tongues or beaks, the brush turkeys must have areas which are extremely sensitive to heat. And so, during incubation, they plunge their heads down into the leaves and check that the temperature remains between 30 and 35 degrees centigrade. The system, which we might think is a recent original innovation, is in fact the demonstration accepted by many scientists as proof of just how closely the mound builders are in evolutionary terms to the reptiles. For only reptiles and the group of brush turkeys use this particular and effective system of incubation. Although there is enormous variety of birds in Australia, the outstanding examples of wildlife evolution in this continent belong to an entirely different branch of the animal kingdom. In those distant forests 100 million years ago, they lived different types of mammals who sought to ensure their survival by using different means of reproduction. The monotremes, the oldest of all, were mammals but laid eggs. The eutherians gave birth to completely developed young, and the marsupials, somewhere between these two extremes, completed their development outside the mother's body. Competition was extremely tough. The eutherian mammals were victorious in almost all the corners of the earth. But when Australia became an independent island around 50 million years ago, none of these new mammals with placentas had yet colonized its lands. And Terra Australis became the kingdom of the marsupials. Night in the southern hemisphere is full of ghosts from the past. When darkness falls, shadows come to life in the ancient forests of northeast Australia. The yellow-bellied gliders move silently around the trunks of the dense forest in search of sap and resin. When the dinosaurs prowled around the jungles of Gondwana, their cycle of activity took place during the daytime, determined by the sun, which activated their gigantic circulatory systems. At that time, the mammals were nocturnal creatures who, whenever possible, avoided encounters with the enormous lizards. The habits of those first marsupials can still be observed in many of the species of present-day Australia, and the nights are alive with furtive movements. The possums, along with the kangaroos, are considered the most evolved of the marsupials, but despite this they remain faithful to the nocturnal traditions of their origins. 
Millions of years in the dark of the jungle has equipped them with excellent climbing skills and the ability to see and hear in the humid shadows of their environment. Like the gliders, the possums, such as this bush-tailed variety, lick the sap which oozes from a broken branch or a damaged tree trunk. Climbing is for them synonymous with survival. There are now no large predators in Australia, but the possums are small animals and this makes them vulnerable to the carnivorous marsupials. For the European scientists, basing their studies on the original zoological classifications, it was clear that the marsupials were inferior to the mammals that inhabited the old continent of Europe. So much so that they named the mammals of this European group Eutherians, which in Greek means perfect mammals. For these zoologists, the Eutherian mammals had displaced their competitors because they were able to keep their young inside their bodies until they were completely formed, whereas the young of the marsupials complete their development in the pouch used for this purpose. But if the first zoological classification had been carried out in Sydney instead of in the ancient Athens, the conclusions might well have been very different. The marsupials were, it is true, displaced by the Eutherian mammals, but the reasons for this are to be found not in the pouches of the marsupials, but rather at the other end. And to understand why, nothing better than to return to the place where the struggle for survival originally took place. The jungles of South America were, like those of Australia, once part of Gondwana. Back then, monotremes, marsupials and eutherians coexisted in the primeval forests. But the last of these three, little by little, gained ground as their new evolutionary prototypes improved. And these monkeys of the new world are the best examples of the final victors. The ability to adapt which tipped the balance was not based on the different ways of giving birth, but rather on the development of the brain, the center where information and associations are stored. It was not therefore a question of the marsupial's pouch versus the placenta, but something much more effective and decisive, intelligence. The new mammals not only had placentas, they were also more intelligent, and they took over the majority of the habitats of the monotremes and the marsupials. But defeat was not quite as absolute as people tend to think, because in the South American night, old ghosts from Gondwana still hide. This is an opossum, a marsupial which is so well equipped to compete against its eternal rivals that not only has it not disappeared from South America, it has even managed to conquer the lands of the north of the continent. However, despite these occasional victories, the marsupials of Gondwana would not have achieved the variety they now display if geology and luck had not been on their side. Everything began with a great journey across the Indian Ocean millions of years ago. When Australia separated from the continental landmass, there were no Eutherian mammals living in its territory, and the vast island drifted north, leaving the marsupials and the monotremes free from competitors.
This was just the beginning of the great marsupial adventure, a period of enormous changes. On its journey northwards, Australia became increasingly warm and its jungles became smaller. The climate of the island slowly changed. The plants had to adapt or die. New species gave birth to new forests, more open and without the splendor of the old jungles, but composed of experts in survival. And the old plants of the southern supercontinent gave way to others, more modern and much more effective, flowering plants. Flowering plants and more open spaces had immediate consequences for the zoology of Australia. The new forests were more accessible than the jungles, and the flowers were attractive, appetizing, and highly nutritious food sources. And very soon, animals arrived to eat them. The number of insects rapidly multiplied and became valuable allies in pollination, so the plants also benefited and spread throughout the length and breadth of the drifting continent. For the birds, the change was a twofold advantage because many of them fed on the ever more numerous insects, while for others, the flowers were valuable sources of energy. And like the birds, the mammals also took advantage of this constant increase in resources. The hare wallabies made double use of the bush forests. Not only did they eat the flowers, fruits and shoots, but they also found here a safe refuge in which to live. This spectacled hare wallaby is marking its territory in the full light of day. Because once the enormous lizards of Gondwana had disappeared, the daylight hours were free from these colossal competitors and some marsupials became diurnal. The quokka is a survivor of the changing forests. Although it prefers the dense jungles, in the new bush forests it found sufficient vegetation to survive and ended up colonizing them. The numbat, on the other hand, specialized in obtaining food from a source not exploited by any other marsupial. It is today the only animal in Australia which feeds on termites, an excellent way of avoiding competition. But not everything was easy for these small, adaptable mammals of the island of Australia. Sooner or later, the food chain had to be completed and with so many small animals available, it was not long before predators appeared. The olive-colored python is a real all-rounder. Small marsupials, lizards, tiny birds and reptile eggs all form part of its diet and it is equally adept at hunting on the ground or in the trees. Each change in the climate meant a change in the vegetation, and each one of these was followed by an endless number of adaptations by the animals. And Australia continued moving north on its slow journey across the Indian Ocean. The closer it came to the Tropic of Capricorn, the more temperate the climate became. 
Where once there had been jungle, vast open plains appeared. The pasture took over the land and new colonists appeared, some of them close relatives of those who still now live hidden in the last remaining jungles of Australia. The emu is a close relative of the cassowary, but because it has been able to adapt to the plains, it has spread over a much larger area of Australia. When the breeding season arrives, the males do almost all the work. In a protected spot from which the surrounding area can be observed, the male prepares a simple nest. The female merely lays the eggs and then leaves incubation up to her mate. During this time, approximately two months, the male does not eat, drink or even defecate, while the female only helps him for the first two weeks, chasing away intruders. To be able to survive this harsh test, the male accumulates fat before courtship and enters a state of semi-lethargy during the incubation. But it's all worth it if, after eight weeks, the chicks are hatched safe and sound. The emus are great lovers of water on which they depend to a great extent in the heat of the Australian plains. Even the chicks are able to swim just a week after emerging from the egg and, once they have hatched, Father Emu goes off to slake his thirst, with all his offspring trotting along behind. The open plains were a new testing ground for the animals of Australia. To survive here, it was necessary not only to be able to withstand seasonal droughts and feed on grasses, but also to be able to flee from enemies at great speed. With their powerful legs, the emus can run at 50 kilometers an hour. But how did the marsupials manage? Away from the protective cover of the forest, there were no trees to seek refuge in, and the main food source was pasture. And nonetheless, the plains were to be the place where the most emblematic animals of the entire continent would evolve, the kangaroos. Wallabies, Padamelons, wallaroos and kangaroos themselves developed a dentition and a digestive system which enabled them to feed on the tough grasses. Out on the plains, they were more exposed, especially in the breeding season. But the very fact they are marsupials proved to be a great advantage. When they had to take flight, they simply put their young in the pouch and fled at great speed. The marsupial's pouch replaced the protective jungles for these young and inexpert kangaroos. There they had shelter, protection. But the adaptations of the kangaroos did not stop there. The development of a powerful tail provided stability, which meant they were able to stand up on two legs and remain erect above the grasses, scanning the vast horizon. The tail was also the final touch in the most important adaptive weapon of all, powerful legs which enabled it to flee at great speed, and what's more, to do so by jumping, and so avoiding the obstacles of the landscape. A quoll, a carnivorous marsupial which the colonists named the native cat in order to distinguish it from the domestic cats they brought with them in their ships. Like the real cats, the quolls are expert hunters and the Australian night is full of potential prey.
Insects are an important part of the diet of this small, silent, nocturnal hunter, so the formation of open land was to their advantage. The flowers attracted insects and hunting became easier. But approximately 15 million years ago, when the continent of Australia came close enough to the islands of what is now Indonesia, some rodents managed to reach the coast and immediately became highly valued prey for the native hunters. In the ancestral competition among the different groups of mammals, this was a victory for the marsupials. 20 million years of isolation meant they were the best equipped to dominate their territories, and these small Eutherian mammals, far from posing a threat, became an important part of their diet. In the distant days of the fragmentation of Gondwana, Australia was inhabited by large marsupials. Some of them were herbivores, some the size of present-day hippopotamuses, and others vicious hunters, similar to today's lions and tigers. But the fight between hunters and prey in present-day Australia is on a somewhat more modest scale. On the soft ground covered in leaves, a bandicoot is looking for worms and insects hidden in the shadows. The same leaves that hide tasty mouthfuls also serve to cover its tunnels in which it takes refuge when danger appears. Because though they may look cute, some of the nocturnal marsupials are in fact fierce hunters. The brush-tailed Fasco gale is not the cheeky squirrel it appears to be. The first colonists in Sydney baptized it the vampire marsupial and spoke of it as a bloodthirsty killer. And perhaps it is for the cockroaches, beetles and spiders which make up the main part of its diet. Because the evident exaggeration of the colonists is due more to the character of the Fasco gale than to the raids which, from time to time, it makes on the hen houses where it kills and devours the birds. The unions of marsupials and rodents made new adaptations necessary. Both groups competed for the same resources, and in this battle new and original means of survival appeared. The stick-nest rat is one of these survivors. It is a small rodent, barely 20 centimeters long, which feeds on leaves and fruits, and is much sought after by the carnivorous marsupials. In order to survive, it learned to construct large nests with branches and leaves which covered and protected its underground galleries. But the adaptations which made it possible for it to thrive in the world of the marsupials were of little use when the white man arrived in Australia and it is now in serious danger of extinction. The trees of the jungle were always a place of refuge and expansion for the marsupials. As foliage became sparser due to climate warming, they were forced to colonize the plains and grasslands. But some of the close relatives of those who live on the pastures returned to the trees they had originally come from, and this is the result. The ornate tree kangaroo is one of the seven species of kangaroos that learn to climb. As this group of animals spread into new areas, the ornate variety was the one which reached furthest north, colonizing the lands of New Guinea. The kangaroos were the result of millions of years of adaptations in order to survive out on the open plains. Why then did they return to the trees with the enormous renewed effort to adapt that that implies? 
There is no clear answer. Probably in order to get at the tempting foods which are out of reach, high up in the trees. When the slow evolutionary changes began, those kangaroos had no competitors for the leaves at the top of the trees. The plains were very extensive and the food sources scarce, so new types of kangaroos began to appear with different features. Stronger front legs, powerful claws, and finally the ability to move each one of its four legs independently, something which no kangaroo down on the ground is able to do. At the same time, the different kangaroos that had invaded the plains were in competition with each other. But as the climate became increasingly temperate and there was ever more open land, the kangaroos, which had developed a digestive system capable of assimilating the tough grasses, continued to expand. And at the same time, some trees also adapted to the increasingly temperate climate of Australia. And one in particular, the eucalyptus, was so successful that it spread throughout the continent, from north to south, creating a new type of forest. And as soon as this new habitat appeared, there was a marsupial ready to take advantage of it. The koala was able to colonize the eucalyptus forests thanks to an adaptation which would seem impossible the ability to feed on its leaves. The leaves of the eucalyptus tree are a combination of low quality food, indigestible material and active poisons. Any animal that could adapt and make use of these leaves would have absolutely no competitors and that is precisely what the koala did. Taking care of the young is especially complicated in this world of toxin-laden foods. After completing their development in the mother's pouch, breastfeeding for six months long, the time comes for the cubs to be weaned and start feeding on the eucalyptus leaves. At this time, the mother excretes special soft feces, a kind of pulp of half-digested leaves which she uses to feed her young. As well as nourishing them, these feces inoculate the young with the microorganisms they will need for this difficult digestion. From then on, they will become independent from their mothers. For most part of the day, the koalas rest among the branches of the trees. This is part of their metabolic strategy. As the food is very poor, nothing better than to rest for 20 hours a day and be able to function with the least expenditure of energy. Their specially adapted digestive system takes care of the rest. 500 grams of these poisonous leaves a day are enough to keep a koala going. On the ground, the koalas are clumsy and vulnerable. Their feet, which are designed for climbing, are not made for walking on four legs. So they only leave the safety of the branches to move from one tree to another in search of more food or a female ready to mate. The koala is an example of the incredible versatility of adaptation of the marsupial mammals of Australia. But what happened to the monotremes, those primitive mammals which were also part of the exodus of Terra Australis, along with the marsupials in those distant days of Gondwana? Some scientists consider them the losers. Others, perhaps more romantically, prefer to believe that they simply retired from the constant competition among mammals and chose to live just as they had for millions of years, discreetly, almost anonymously, in the most remote corners of the dense jungles, at their own pace and indifferent to the rest of the world. Today in 
the entire world, there are only three existing species of these archaic mammals that lay eggs. Two of them are echidnas, the long-snouted variety in New Guinea, and this one, the short-snouted variety, which can be found throughout Australia. The third member of the family is the strangest mammal known to man, the duck-billed platypus, a shy animal which lives in some rivers in the east of Australia. The rivers of Australia were no exception in the parallel evolution which has taken place over the 50 million years that Australia has been travelling alone across the Indian Ocean. Fish and invertebrates acquired new forms, some of them as strange as the Neoceratodus, the Australian lunged fish whose origins go back to the Devonian era, approximately 350 million years ago. But the most extraordinary creature now living in the rivers of Australia originally developed on land. The duck-billed platypus looks like an impossible compendium of different zoological types. From the time Dawson sent his controversial sample to the British Natural History Museum, there were constant scientific discussions, lasting for over a hundred years, until finally two zoologists demonstrated irrefutably that they were indeed mammals and reproduced by laying eggs. Although they are small in size, the duck-billed platypuses would seem to have an insatiable appetite. This one has found a river crab. Crustaceans, mollusks, annelids, and even amphibians form part of their extremely varied diet. And their peculiar morphology means they are able to hunt their prey even in muddy waters. Using its webbed feet and broad muscular tail to propel itself along, the archaic platypus searches the river bottom. The sensors on its beak detect the slightest movement or change in temperature. Any animal crawling or swimming along the riverbed is rapidly located and, if it is of any interest, devoured. In the rivers of Australia, the platypus is so well adapted it has no competitors, or rather, almost none. As in so many other environmental niches, the placentary mammals have also come up with a prototype. On this occasion, the result of the evolutionary process was the water rat or beaver rat, which was able to thrive in the aquatic world thanks to its waterproof fur and partially webbed feet. Strangely, no marsupial try to colonize the rivers of Australia, and so the freshwater resources of this continent are shared between the modern water rat and the archaic duck-billed platypus. The Aborigines who arrived in Australia 50,000 years ago already knew the duck-billed platypus, which they named the water mole. A very appropriate name, given that the platypus lives out its amphibious life between the water, where it finds food, and the riverbanks, where it digs its tunnels. Their dependence on the rivers, however, limited the spread of the survivor from Gondwana. Because as Australia became increasingly dry, as the rivers of the interior slowly disappeared with the rise in temperatures, deserts were formed. In the 
vast interior of Australia, water is the scarcest of all resources. Among these ancient mountains and valleys worn away by millions of years of erosion lie the last remaining watercourses of bone-dry Australia. The wallabies of Rothschild Rock seek out the shade of the enormous scars which the weather has gradually opened in the granite masses. Here in the irregular passageways of the rocky maze, there is a difference of at least 15 degrees centigrade compared to the surface scorched by the sun, while in the freezing cold nights, the rocks radiate back part of the heat absorbed during the day, and so they are also the wallabies' heating system. The valleys of the interior, protected by the oldest mountains on Earth, are the final concession of the climate of this new Australia, a continent inhabited by animals increasingly well equipped to cope with heat and drought. Because beyond these valleys, stretching across to an apparently infinite horizon, lies the unforgiving desert. heat, wind, and sand. Around three quarters of Australia is now arid desert terrain. Where in the past the prehistoric jungles grew, today the landscape is composed of dunes and rocks scorched and eroded. And nonetheless, the slow process which created the deserts turned mountains into sand also gave the marsupials time to get ready to conquer them. And once more, they manage to find a way. Sunset, when the scorching, merciless heat finally abates, marks the beginning of activity in the desert. The western barred bandicoots emerge from their lairs in search of small animals. Like them, the insect spiders and other invertebrates once more become active as twilight falls, and the bandicoots take advantage of this. Almost all the small marsupials which live in or around the desert take advantage of the shade and protection of the scarce, sparse bushes, digging their lairs beneath them so that the entrance to their shelters is as protected and as cool as possible. For this reason, they rarely move far from them, and when they feel threatened, they run into the thicket where, hidden among the branches, they are able to reach the entrances to their lairs. The bilbies have also come out with the fall of night. Few animals are as strange looking as these inhabitants of the Australian desert. Their large ears and long snouts are what give them their extremely developed sense of hearing and smell. In the dark of the night and inside the large galleries which the bilbies dig, seeing is not important, and so they are relatively short-sighted animals. It is their sense of smell which enables them to find the larvae, insects, seeds and fungi on which they feed, and their ears are able to detect the arrival of possible enemies, 
because the inhospitable desert is also home to a number of hunters. A monitor lizard is out hunting. This powerful lizard well knows the habits of the small marsupials and rodents of the desert regions and is sniffing around a clump of bushes looking for the entrance to the galleries in which the mammals take shelter during the daylight hours. In Australia there are 20 species of monitor lizards or guanas as they are known here. They live in almost all the ecosystems of the continent, demonstrating their ability to adapt to all types of the environment. They are, in a way, the final revenge of those enormous dinosaurs which, in remote times, over 100 million years ago, ruled over these lands, now changed beyond all recognition. The blue-tongued lizard is much less powerful than its relatives, the monitor lizards, but evolution has ensured it is equipped to defend itself in this world of hunters and prey. A curious black-shouldered kite approaches and the lizard brings out one of its weapons. A large blue tongue, extremely threatening in appearance and, moreover, poisonous, serves to frighten off possible predators. This is not, however, the case of the black-shouldered kite, which, after a brief inspection, flies off. The Australian reptiles, like all the other classes of land animals, found their space within the generous and changing island in the southern hemisphere. But 50,000 years ago, a new creature arrived from the north. It was different from any of those already living here and had one devastating peculiarity. Instead of adapting to the environment, it forced the surroundings to change and to adapt to it. The arrival of man brought violent changes. Never before had Australia changed so rapidly and at such a speed that it did not give time for species to adapt. Along with man, other invaders also arrived. At first, with the Aborigines, they came slowly and in small numbers, giving rise to new species which displaced the native ones. This is the case of the dingo and the marsupial wolf. But with the arrival of the white colonists, the influx of aggressive invaders posed a serious threat to the wildlife of Australia. Rats, rabbits, cats and foxes, asses and dromedaries, buffaloes and wild pigs laid bare entire regions. These new invasions have demonstrated the fragility of an ecosystem which for so long remained isolated, and the not too distant future may well bring yet another threat. Australia continues on its slow drift northwards at a speed of six centimeters a year. At present, a narrow strait is all that separates the fauna of the two continents. But what will happen when the animals of Asia and Oceania come into direct contact? There may well be enormous upheavals in the uncertain future of this continent. It is easy to imagine that the evolution of its landscapes and animals will undergo far-reaching changes. But probably when new specialized creatures adapt to the unique conditions of these forests or deserts, causing many of the evolutionary prototypes that now dominate Australia to die out in the farthest depths of the jungle with their Pacific and archaic way of life, there will continue to be echidnas and duckbill platypuses. And, as in Gondwana and the distant past, there will continue to be mammals who lay eggs. <laughs>